Awesome. Good morning, I guess. It's still morning. Um, it is great to see everybody. It's great to be together. Um, we're going to talk about God's Word. I was asked to share about God's Word. Um, so whenever I think of God's Word, for me, it's totally a love letter. Uh, because if there's anything God thinks about you, He loves you. And uh, prayerfully through this lesson today, that message will come through to your hearts and you'll deeper understand how much God loves all of us. Amen. And happy Father's Day to the dads. It's the most amazing uh, blessing uh, to be able to be a dad. Um, it's also very nerve-wracking and very crazy and very difficult and clearly the most difficult title you've ever carried is dad. Um, but it is a blessing to uh, be able to be a family here. And it's awesome to have uh, the greatest father ever. And uh, you guys are incredibly blessed to be able to have a worship team like this. Um, some, some, some applause for your amazing worship team. Uh, <clears throat> This is my family. I'm on the left. My name is Sean. Uh, I was born in Kansas, uh, but 29 years ago moved on to the mission field um, and have been there ever since. Uh, that's my wife, Lena, on the right. She was the 104th baptism of the Moscow Church of Christ. And uh, we fell in love, and then we learned how to speak each other's languages, and we're still together after 27 years. Amen? <laughs> so that's incredible. Um, and then that's my daughter, Diana. She just finished her sophomore year in college. And my son, Andrew, uh, he's finished college and he's actually working in Moscow right now. Uh, but the whole family will be together tomorrow. Uh, so COVID didn't give us many chances to come together. So it's actually going to be the second or third time we've seen each other in the last year and a half. Uh, so it's great that that can happen in Atlanta. Um, so it's great to be here. Um, let's jump into the Bible. In case you want to know more about me or follow me, I'm Sean's Borscht. Um, you know, in America, you guys have chicken soup for the soul. In Russia, we have Borscht for the soul. So um, it's a different world completely, but it's awesome uh, to be a part of that. Look at Hebrews chapter 4. Now, some of these verses are familiar to some of us, but hopefully they'll still inspire us. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit and joints and marrow. You know, the word of God is unbelievable. It's living and active. Now, it looks like a book, but it's not a book. It's actually God working in our lives through that book book. It's, it's unbelievable. You can read a certain passage of the Bible for the 50th time, and it can hit you totally different. It's like being married for 27 years. You think you know somebody, but you're still surprised after 27 years. It, that's just like, it's a living relationship. It's like this, you open it up, and there's this ocean of relationship with an infinite God. Um, like Narnia, it, it looks like a wooden box, but when you go in, there's this whole world inside of that box. That's the Word of God. It's living, it's active. Whether you're a teen, it's exactly what you need to hear. If you're a campus kid, it'll talk to you completely. And if you're single, if you're getting married, if you're about to have your baby or your second baby, or if you're about to send your kids off to college, the Bible can speak to you perfectly. No matter what's going on in your life, the Bible... God knows what you need. He speaks to us through his word. No matter who you are today, the Bible is the answer to whatever it is that troubles you. It's the answer if you're looking for inspiration. The word of God is alive and it's active. Amen? Now, back in my day, before I believed in God, I was an atheist, uh, I relied on the eight ball. That was my sense of guidance, right? Like, will she ever like me? No. Okay, let me shake that again. No. Now, for anybody less than 40 or 50 years old, you have no idea what I'm talking about, but that was, that was a ball you shake and it gives you answers for life. It gives you direction. It was amazing. Now, this generation, of course, has Google. Um, whenever you have a question, you just ask Google. Uh, but I want to encourage all of us here, the eight ball nor Google has the answers for your life. The eight ball in Google will not get you through everything that's going to come at you in your life. An eight ball in Google will not get you to heaven. The Bible, God, he leads us. He takes care of us. How, how is it possible that I'm an atheist? I have no faith in God. And then nine months later, I'm on a mission team to the Soviet Union. 
how is it that I'm an atheist who spent his whole life trying to get to Wall Street, landed a job on Wall Street, and then would rather leave that behind to go to a country I have no idea what's waiting for me? What could do that? The Word of God can do that. And all of you sitting here, if you've opened the Bible, seriously looked at the Bible, you have stories yourself of how God has totally changed the way you view things because of his word. Amen? Amen. Um, it says the Bible is able to separate soul and spirit. Now, we have certain instincts. I don't know about you, but I'm watching this TV series right now, and the guy keeps making the same mistake. And I'm like, are you serious? You're going to do the same wrong thing again? Do you ever learn? And then I like look in the mirror and I think, I need to say that to myself several times. But it's like a dog chasing his tail. Really? Well, like my, my dog, he's so loyal until there's cheese. And then he, he abandons me immediately. It's like, it's like there's moments of true spirituality, it seems to me, but then, then cheese is introduced or another dog who's cuter than me. And then it's, I lose him immediately. All of us have certain instincts and little traps we fall into and things we kind of wish we weren't doing and, or weren't thinking. The Bible is what separates soul and spirit. It's what helps you to be spiritual. Have you ever had moments where you're not viewing things very spiritual and you're, you're just struggling? And then you like read the Bible or you spend time in the Bible and it just it gets easier. It just... That's what the Bible does. It, it separates us from our just natural human instincts to being like-minded with Jesus, thinking how he would think. What would Jesus do? How would he feel? Not how I feel at this moment, but the Bible gets me where Jesus is feeling, what Jesus thinks. And when I'm struggling with, with being upset or being angry or, or situations are, are concerning me or bothering me, it's usually because I'm too much down here and I need God's word to get me back up here. If you don't believe me, you can test it, but I don't recommend it. Spend two hours just reading stuff on Facebook. Just read Facebook for two hours. And then, and then step away from that and just read the Bible. Read the book of Acts for two hours. And tell me how you feel after each of those episodes. The Bible separates soul and it, it helps us to be spiritual. Amen? Now, also, it divides joints and marrow. Joints like the skeleton, it, it holds us up. We need structure. We need skeleton. We need to know the church is at 11. We need to know where it is. We need to know what's happening here and that we have midweek and we, and we have meetings and there's things we do that keep us connected, that help us to build ourselves up. But if all you do is follow the skeleton, if all you do is check off where you're supposed to be and, and where you're supposed to show up, if there's not the marrow, if there's not the, and I don't know if you know this, but inside of your bones, there's bone marrow. And bone marrow is actually where all your cells are made. Actually, your bones today will produce 240 billion new cells. Your bones are going to do that. That's where your life comes from, from inside the bones. Now, some crazy writer of the Bible 2,000 years ago somehow understood that you can separate bone from mar the, the marrow from the the. the how in the world did they know that? And some of us, we can get into the skeleton but lose the life, the, the, the marrow behind it, the, the excitement, the passion. And all of us know this as well. There's been times I've shown up and I'm thinking, I could stay here all day. This is awesome. And then there's other days I show up and I'm like, okay, what time is this over? What helps me be one way or not the other way? It's the word of God. The Word of God separates it from just being a structure, just an event, to your heart really being in it, to the passion being in it, to being excited about what it is we're doing. You can be here and be totally excited, or you can be here just checking in. And the reason you're one way or the other is because of how the Word of God is working in your mind and heart today. Amen, church? Amen. We need God's Word to strengthen us. Now, church can be boring if our heart's not in it. If the morrow's not there, it can become stale. 
The last 10 months, I, it was great to hug Anthony. The last 10 months, we've been on a Revive team, and basically we call it Revive. But me and my wife, um, we're working with the churches in Eastern Europe, and for the next prayerfully 10 years, we've basically packed up and left our home in Kiev and put our stuff in our suitcases. And my daughter now is an empty nester. She sent her parents off. <laughs> so she's, goodbye parents, good luck, we love you, you can do it. Um, and she's an empty nester and she goes to school across the street uh, at university, which is great for her. And uh, we packed up our suitcases and we're gonna try and get to the different countries in Eastern Europe that are still 30 or 40 Christians in the entire country. And they've been 30 or 40 Christians for the last 20, 30 years. And there's not much hope in those nations that Christianity is gonna spread to the next generation or to different cities in those nations. But me and Lena felt like if we go to these countries and teams would come with us, 20, 30 people would come with us and spend a year, take a year off of school, take a year out of their career or empty nesters, just come spend a year and help us to work together on the ground to set up those nations to, to be able to have what you have here in North River so that they could plant churches, so that their kids and their grandkids have a church and a swamp camp to go to. And I just wanted to thank each one of you because your generosity season and generosity, your, your, your sacrifice for the special missions that you've done year after year allows us to be able to be on the mission field. Thank you for all your sacrifice because we're all in this together. We're partners. It's not me, the missionary, and you're here. No, we're all missionaries. We're all somewhere on this crazy planet trying to save this world and we're all in this together, but I'm personally very grateful for all of you sacrificing for us to be able to be over there. So if you could give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you. And thank you to the Browns and the Ottenwellers who always adopt the Wooten family and always invite us here to be uh, with you and to get refreshed and encouraged. But this is church. Church is not a meeting. Church is not a building. Church is a group of people who've decided they're going to be as much like Jesus every day as they possibly can. And that's not very easy, so we come together often to get encouraged and inspired, and we can see each other's examples, so we can sharpen each other's example of being more and more like Jesus. And that's, that's what church is. We'll take a group of 20 or 30 people and land in a country, and, and there's church. And, and I love some of these photos. Uh, that's the Revive team. In the lower left-hand corner, there was the sweetest sister, a teen in the Odessa church. She bought everybody on the Revive team a pair of Christmas socks. And then she wrote a verse on every one of them. Something like, your, your feet have brought good news to my soul. And in all these, these kind little notes, a 16-year-old little, little teen in the Odessa church, and that's, that's all of us showing off our Christmas socks. Um, in the upper right-hand corner, that's a cafe called Maryberry. And what we did is we just picked a huge cafe in the middle of the city and we said, this is now our home base. And what we would do is we'd invite people all over the city and invite them to Maryberry to study the Bible. And there were times 80, 90, 100 people, every table in the cafe was filled with people studying the Bible. And as soon as you finish the study, if they left, then we went out to share our faith with more people and bring in more people to study the Bible. And it was like this, we called it the Maryberry Church of Christ. It's the first, <laughs> it's the first Maryberry Church of Christ. And it's so cute because now that we've left Odessa, they miss us so much. I got a text message from one of the owners of the Maryberry to say, we miss you so much today because Sunday was our big day. We had tons of people coming in there. They're like, where are you guys today? And I was like, I'm sorry, I'm in Atlanta. Like, oh, we want to come with you. It's like, but that's what the word of God does. It, it, it builds our relationships. We are church together. Amen. A couple more photos. There's Anthony in the upper right hand corner. Um, an amazing uh, guy, Gabriel, who is Muslim. Actually, I'm sure Anthony will tell the story, so I won't. Um, but it was great to see him become a Christian. It's awesome to be a family, amen? But it's the word of God that brings us together. Next verse here. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Okay. All of the scripture is useful. Uh, this is a buffet. You know, when you go to a buffet, you pick out what you like. Um, and you don't 
take what you don't like. Um, the Bible is, is not a buffet. Uh, you can't kind of take what you like and kind of leave out what you don't. Um, it's the whole thing. All of it's useful for teaching, training, correcting, and rebuking. So teaching, right? Teach because I just don't know. Uh, the Bible teaches us things we just didn't know what God thinks about things. Correcting is helpful. It's like a GPS, right? If you make a wrong turn, you want to be corrected. It's not like you get angry at your GPS. What are you, what are you correcting me for? What, what's up with you? I mean, I paid for you. Say something nice about me. Tell me I'm going the right way even when I'm not. Well, no, that's not why you want a GPS. You, you want to know where you're going. In the Bible, it corrects us. So hopefully we don't get tired if we're going the wrong direction of being told we could turn around and it could be better. Um, then it says here, uh, training. And just because someone teaches me or shows me how to hit a forehand doesn't mean I can do it. I got to practice it. Um, I was a tennis player and you, you hit thousands of balls. And even after a thousand, you still hit another. You just, if we don't train, if we don't put it into practice, if it's just in our minds, but we don't do it, then the Bible doesn't come alive. Enough. Then rebuking, right? Sometimes we get in the danger of actually losing our salvation or causing other people harm. And at those moments, the Bible actually rebukes us. We need God's word. God's word is the answer to help us. If you're feeling a little stuck with something right now, God's word is what you need. I had a brother call me once, uh, and he asked me if we could get together. And I said, sure, we could get together. And he said, well, I just need some help. I said, I'm happy to help you. And uh, I said, how about in, f in like three or four days? And he said, oh, four, four days would be great. I said, okay. Have you been reading your Bible lately? And he said, well, no, I haven't been reading my Bible. I said, okay, for the next four days, if you could just read your Bible every day, then we'll meet on the fourth day. And he said, okay, yeah, I can read my Bible every day. So I call him the night before we're supposed to meet. And I said, how are you doing? Are we still meeting tomorrow? He said, yeah, let's meet tomorrow. That'll be great. And I said, have you been reading your Bible? And he said, well, no, I haven't read my Bible yet. And I said, well, let's, let's not meet tomorrow. Let's meet in three or four days after you've read your Bible for three or four days. Because I can't, I can't help you. I'll try, but you need the Bible. And I'm not, I don't want us to meet until you've read the Bible at least three or four days in a row. And he said, okay, that's fair. So I call him three days later, the day before, I said, hey, bro, are, are, how are you doing? He said, oh, I'm great. I said, so are we meeting tomorrow? No, I said, are, have you been reading your Bible? He said, bro, three days ago I read one chapter, two days ago I read two chapters, Yesterday, I read like five chapters. Bible's awesome. And I was like, oh, that's great. I said, so what time do you want to meet tomorrow? He said, no, I'm okay. I'm good. <laughs> I said, what do you mean you're good? He said, well, the Bible, I mean, just feel, I feel like I've worked it out. I'm, I'm good. I don't. And I was like, bro, you're awesome. <laughs> and I said, I'm happy just to hang. But that, that is, that is, sometimes we think it's one of us that's going to fix one of us. Or if we're not doing well, we think that person's the reason I'm not doing. It's really not that much about each other. Although I think we play an invaluable role in each other's lives, but without the Word of God, we will be stuck. Amen, church? Amen. Wanted to share this story briefly. Um, the woman in the middle, her name's Maria. That's our brother Andrew on the right. Now, Andrew had been a Christian for many years, like 20 years, and his mom had never come to anything. She was not interested in coming to church. Nothing was interesting to her. She's like, she's very orthodox, so she's very against anything kind of a Protestant type religion. So one day a sister came up to Andre and said, hey, would it be okay if I just came over to your house and read the Bible with your mom? And he's like, well, you can try, but that may not go well. And she's like, well, ask her. And so and Andre talked to his mom and said, mom, there's a, you know, a sister, Leonard from the church, she wants to come and read the Bible with you. Would you be open to that? She's like, well, okay, yeah, that's fine. She can come read the Bible, but I'm not going to your church. So come read the Bible, that's fine. Bible's good. So she came over, started to read the Bible, and she decided to read all the verses about turning to God and repentance and changing your life and getting your sins forgiven and baptism and just decided to focus on all those verses and read the stories through Acts. So they're sitting there just reading lots and lots of scriptures, and she's like, after about 30 minutes, she's like, hold it. Are you trying to tell me I need to change my life and get baptized? And then it's like, I didn't, I, I didn't say anything. We're just reading the Bible. She's like, are you telling me I need to get baptized? I was like, I don't. <laughs> She's like, give me your phone. And she hands her the phone and said, dial my son. I thought, uh-oh, we're in trouble now. <laughs> Dialed the son, handed the phone. 
He says, Andre, you need to come home. I'm getting baptized. <laughs> and then it's like, whoa, we, we could look at some other verses too. Um, but awesome conclusion. Um, so they started studying the Bible and they studied the Bible every day for like two weeks. And Andre, this is the day Andre baptized his mom, uh, Maria. That's the power of God's word, right? That's the power of God's word. Two weeks after Maria was baptized, she had a stroke and she fell into a coma. And they put her in the hospital in a coma. And after two and a half days, she woke up from the coma. And in the room, nobody was in there except another woman laying in a bed next to her. And Maria looked a little bit around and then looked at the woman next to her. And word for word, I tell you, she said to this woman, you need to get your life right with God. <laughs> this woman's like, hello? <laughs> like, like you, were, you were just laying there, haven't said a word since you've come in this room, and now you're... Didn't even say, where's the doctor? Where's my children? What's wrong with me? Where am I? It was like, you need to get your life right with God. And they introduced themselves to each other and started talking a few minutes. And then Glenn's like, you gotta, you gotta study the Bible. You, you need to study the Bible. She was trying to convince this woman. They were talking about 30 or 40 minutes and M Maria fell back into a coma. About two hours after that, uh, Andre walks into the hospital expecting just to see mom in a coma. And the, the other woman's laying there and says, your mom woke up. And Andre's like, she, she did? What, did? what did she say? Did she say anything? <laughs> well, she told me I need to get my life right with God and that I'm supposed to study the Bible. And Andre was so encouraged that mom on the brink of possibly passing away, it's so much in her heart and ma mind, her Christianity and the need to be with God. He's like, so what happened? Well, then, then she fell back into the coma. And uh, so a few hours passed, and then later that evening, mom passed away. Galena, the woman laying next to her, completely recovered, got out of the hospital, felt like she really needed to study the Bible and get her life right with God. And two weeks after that, Galena was baptized into Christ. You know, when I heard that story, it just totally blew my mind. What the power of the word of, wait a minute, this person's not open at all. Look, could we just read the Bible? Yeah, read the Bible, but forget it. I'll never. What is this saying, right? The word of God can change our lives. Amen. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I want to encourage us. It's, it's not enough to know about Christianity. Now, if you don't know about Jesus, it's so great that you came here today because in this crowd, you can find somebody to open the scriptures. They'll help you understand exactly who Jesus is. Amen. If you don't know about Jesus, there's no chance you're going to make it to heaven. There is no chance without Jesus to make it to heaven. Now, if you don't believe me, that's okay. I'm not a source. You have to read the Bible. You have to come to this conviction on your own. Look at the Bible and see what the Bible teaches. Understand what Jesus has done for each one of you. Now, if you know about Jesus, but you don't hold to his teachings, if you believe in Jesus, but you don't hold to his teachings, you're also not a disciple. It's not enough just to believe or to accept a teaching and think, okay, I believe that's true. It changes our life. It changes the way we live. Now, when you hold to the teachings, then you're set free. Now, I don't know about you guys, but there's several times this last year and a half, I felt like I'm in a cage. I'm afraid. I don't know what to do. I don't know where this is going. I don't know how to do church. I don't know how to seek and save the lost. I feel stuck. We're supposed to go to Hungary. The border closed. Three days later, we're supposed to go to Odessa. That border closed. Now we're going to Istanbul where it's 99% Muslim. What in the world am I doing? Where am I going? What's going to happen? You've probably had moments. What's going to happen? What's going? And, 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 then you, and then you look at Facebook 
because you're looking for some kind of news or the, or the light at the end of the tunnel, and it's doom and gloom everywhere. And society's dividing and being angry and all these crazy things going on and all these things are happening. And you don't feel free. The only thing that will set you free is not more information. It's the Word of God. Holding to Jesus' teaching will set you free. Nothing else will set you free. Amen, church? Amen. Last verse, and we'll close here. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you'll save both yourself and your hearers. See, your decision to, to hold to the scriptures and try and live like Jesus doesn't just impact you. It impacts everybody around you. Amen? You know, I wanted to show you a photo. This is, um, this is a picture of Lena's dad on the day of his baptism. And what happened, it, it's an interesting story. Lena was baptized in 1991. And then about 10 years later, Lena's grandma, who was like 82, who survived World War II and grew, was in 70 years of communism, she became a Christian. And then a few years after that, Lena's mom became a Christian. And then Lena's sister became a Christian. And then Lena's sister's husband became a Christian. And then their kid became a Christian. So everyone in Lena's family is a Christian, amen? Except for dad. Now dad is communist, military engineer, Soviet Union, there is no God. Like that. <laughs> And um, for 27 years now, we've been praying and reaching out to him. I've started studying the Bible and stopped studying the Bible with him six times. This last one was round six. In round six, it's stuck. And it's unbelievable that it's stuck. And it's amazing. I think the first five times it was really me wanting it. Uh, but then thanks to COVID, thanks to lockdown in Russia, um, she was at church, or he was at church every Sunday because it's in the living room on TV. Um, and the, the apartment's just not big enough to go hide from church. So church is coming through whether you want it or not. Um, which I think just started to melt his heart. And he started studying. And then he called me and he said, Sean, I want to study the Bible. And I was like, in the back of my head, I was thinking, round six, let's keep going. Well, I'll do it again. Why not? Um, and we started studying the Bible, and he totally was totally different responding to God's word this time. And then, of course, the baptism, we watched it on Zoom because we couldn't get, couldn't get in the country. And it was so cute because most of the times when I've witnessed mom and dad together, it's sparky. <laughs> not in a positive way. There's friction. There's sparks. And there's times where you're just kind of sitting there quiet, <laughs> acting like you didn't hear it, although there's no, there's, there's no way you didn't hear that. <laughs> so you just kind of stay low and maybe I don't understand Russian well enough to know what was just said. <laughs> so, but this was so cute because as they gathered up to talk about the, you know, to share about him, the whole time they were kind of hugging each other. And then she shared and gave him kisses on the cheek. And I was like, who are you people? <laughs> I don't really believe in alien abduction, but maybe something. No, it was incredible how much God's word had changed that family. And I'm so, so happy for him at 82 years old. He finally became a Christian, which is awesome. Now, but I, I want to share one story as I close. Um, round four, I believe it was when I was trying to study the Bible with him, I, I flew from Kiev to Moscow to actually study the Bible with him. And then I was going to fly back and then go home. Um, and on the flight, it's like a one-hour flight from Kiev to Moscow. And uh, we we're, you know, getting close to landing, uh, almost above the airspace of Moscow. And, and we were circling. And it was relatively sunny with some big, fluffy white clouds. Circling, circling. And we were circling for like an extra hour. And then like an, an extra hour after that, like we were circling for almost two hours. 
I was like, what, you know, what's up with this? And then the pilot comes on and says, you know, please fasten your seatbelt. We're going to come in for a landing. So we come in through the clouds, and then it went completely dark. And the plane was bouncing actively. It, and bouncing and bouncing. And, 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 you know, you kind of look out the window, you're looking for ground. And finally, you break through the clouds, and we started to see the ground. And we're coming in, coming in, coming in. We're getting closer and closer. Okay, okay, praise God, we're about to land. Amen. And as soon as we get like 50 meters from the ground, he hits the gas and pulls up. And the plane screams back up. It's bouncing and shaking and bouncing and shaking and swerving and bouncing and shaking. And then we go for about another minute, and then we break through the clouds. And everyone's kind of looking around. We were thinking... Land. What, what's this? And there's no feedback. Um, there's not a great need on Aeroflot to feel transparent about what's going on in the plane. Um, so we start circling again. And I, I kid you not, for like another hour, we're circling. We're in this plane now for three hours. And I'm thinking, I'm never getting out of this plane. This is it. Aeroflot is the end of my story. And we're circling, and then the pilot finally comes on after another and said, okay, we're coming in for a landing, please, you know. And I was sitting in the emergency row with the stewardess facing me, and I'm kind of watching her for a read. If she's nervous, I'm nervous. If she's chill, I'm chill. And she seems still chill. So we're coming, and I said, okay, this is all. So we, once again, it was kind of light out, but then we hit the clouds, and it just, it just goes dark again. And it is bouncing and bouncing and bouncing and bouncing. And then we break through the clouds, and it's still bouncing and swerving and bouncing. And, and I start to see the ground. You can even see the runway there a little bit ahead of us. And he hits the gas and pulls up again. And my heart just dropped out of me. And at this moment, this wall of hail hits the plane. I mean, it just sounds like there's pellets just hitting everything on the plane. And we're bouncing and swerving, and then we break through the clouds again. So now like three, three and a half hours have passed. The pilot comes on and says, well, we weren't able to land. And I'm like, duh. <laughs> and he's like, we're, we're running low on fuel, so we're going to go to the airport of the south of the city and land there. And everyone's like, okay, you know, whatever. So we circle around Moscow and we land at that airport. And I mean, when we landed, when we touched down, it was like we won the World Cup. I mean, the entire plane <laughs> erupted in joy. I kid you not. There was so much noise and clapping and applause. And you know, usually when people land, they get up at different times and kind of wait their turn. Everybody stood up. Everybody grabbed their bags. Everybody's ready to get off the plane. And we're standing there. We're fired up. This is exciting. Five minutes passed, 10 minutes passed, 20 minutes, I kid, 30 minutes passed, and we're still standing there. And then the pilot came on and said, well, actually, we're not allowed to, allowed to unload the plane here because people had connecting flights with no visas. So we're just refueling, and we're going to take off and go back <laughs> to the airport of doom. <laughs> And you should have seen the faces of everybody in that plane. Everyone just kind of sat down. And at that moment, and I, I kid you not here either, they started to pass out free cups of vodka to everybody. You know, throw us a bone, right? So they got the free vodka being passed out. We take off. And the stewardess is sitting in front of me. I said, so has that ever happened? She's like, that never, that's never happened. To me. And she said, but don't worry. This is like a 20-minute flight. We won't go for altitude. We'll just circle the city and land. And I said, okay. Awesome. So we take off. And as we're coming in, and actually it bumped so much that the, the cockpit door actually flew open. And we start circling on the way back as well. Circling and circling. And I mean, there is lightning. There is lightning out of both sides of the windows. We are bouncing like no tomorrow. We took off at five, it's almost midnight, and I'm still in this plane. And finally, he lands it at like 12.30 or 12, midnight at night. My seven hour flight had come to a conclusion. I was supposed to study the Bible with dad five hours ago, and I'm supposed to be heading to the airport in an hour to catch my flight back in that morning. Now, 
The reason I'm telling you this is not because I work for Aeroflot now. I'm still in the ministry. Um, the reason I'm telling you is imagine, imagine how you would feel if three or four hours into the flight, the pilot came on and said, hey, dear passengers, by the way, I didn't sign up for this. I thought this would be a two-hour flight. Nobody told me about the storm. I thought we had the green. I, I'm actually done. I'm not going to land this plane. It's too much for me. So good luck. Fly Aeroflot in the future. I don't know what he would have. But imagine he just kind of says goodbye. What would be your reaction sitting in the plane to the cockpit? I'm thinking, I'd be thinking, hey, pilot guy, sit back down. Land the plane. I, I can't land the plane. You land the plane. Yeah, but dude, it's really hard and it's stressful and there's turbulence and there's lightning. You just don't understand how I feel. Dude, I feel for you. But you got to land the plane. I have no hope if you won't land the plane. Church, sometimes we find ourselves in turbulence. We got lightning out the left window. We got lightning out the right window. And this five-hour, this one-hour service has turned into five hours, and you got all kinds of things. And like, I think I'm done. I think I'm done. I've had enough. I think the North River and the Atlantic City want to say to you this morning, dude, sit back down. You're our only hope. The North River Church is our only hope. Now, I think there's probably, but you're our hope. You can carry the good news. There's people in your plane that are counting on you to be faithful. They're counting on you to not get tied up with all the craziness in the world. They're counting on you. They're counting on you to forgive when there shouldn't be forgiveness. They're counting on you to accept when there shouldn't be acceptance. They're counting on you to keep being generous when somebody would have given up being generous many years ago. They're counting on you to share with one more person and get rejected one more time, even though you've done that a million times. They're counting on you to land the plane. Amen? Amen. God loves us. God's given us his word. It was a complete honor and privilege to be able to spend this Sunday with you. Love you so much. Thank you for listening, and let's land the plane. Amen?